Today, I am joined by Michael Bailey. Uh, Michael is a psychologist, a behavioral geneticist, a professor at Northwestern University, and the author of The Man Who Would Be Queen, um, and also someone considered to be uh, one of the most unethical uh, sexologists in history by one of the websites of his detractors. Welcome, Michael. You've come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, it's um, it's it's interesting to um, to kind of peruse, uh, you know, what's what's on on the internet about you because I would say ninety percent of the of the articles and resources are about your academic career. They're the actual text of scientific papers you've worked on, you know, relatively respectable reviews of your work in the New York Times. Um, but then there are also, you know, little little I think just websites created just just for the purpose of of uh, I don't know, taking you down. Um, and you've been you've been at this game for a while because your book came out, if I'm not mistaken, in, in 2003. Um, and even back then, while transgender issues, transsexualism wasn't really on the radar for most people. I mean, I don't think anyone that I know would have even imagined that this was a thing. Uh, you were already writing about it. You were, you know, essentially cataloging the status quo on the science of transsexualism and transgenderism. So I wonder how you see the last 20 years, given the fact that you've been someone so, so important in the movement. Like how does it surprise you? That's just something that now, I don't know, <laughs> different family members discuss over dinner that this is the topic du jour. Yeah, it's, it's very surprising. I, I never would have expected it. Uh, when I wrote my book, in fact, um, you know, and I sent it around to first get an agent and then uh, to potential publishers and so on. Got a lot of feedback like, hey, this is really interesting, but, you know, not really, you know, something that people would be interested in widely. Uh, and I remember um, a friend reacting like, I would never read a book like that, you know. And, uh, uh, and yeah, here we are in the last five years. Um, Transgender is um, certainly one of the big two or three issues in academia and and culture, along with race, of course. And uh, yeah, those are the big two, I would guess. Uh, and how did we get from there to here? Well, uh, I'm not sure that I uh, have a uh, complete theory of that, but I can probably speculate a bit. Uh, but I, I would, I do want to clarify something. You said that uh, if you search, you find these little websites about uh, how evil I was. Those are not little websites. Those are big websites. <laughs> they, I inspired quite, you know, the uh, resurrection of complete websites trying to uh, elaborate how uh, evil a person I am and how wrong I am. So, yes, and I think they're still there for people who want to find them. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, obviously kind of a, a rundown of, of, of all your crimes. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it is interesting to see how much energy has been poured into this. Um, it, it's, you know, for, it's about as thoroughly unconvincing as, uh, as you know, the, the title, the tagline that you're the most unethical sexologist in history sounds extremely empirically testable. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I mean, the, I think that the main problem that these uh, activists have with you is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it's the fact that you've been um, advocating in a way this, uh, this, this kind of theory of kind of auto, autogynophilia and um, um, there's kind of um, a taxonomy of, of transsexualism, especially male transsexualism, that is not accepted by the current uh, more high powered members of the, of the transsexual community. So they would like this type of research, this type of knowledge to not be common knowledge. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And uh, if you would like, I could spend a little time explaining. Yes. Autogynophilia is, it's a paraphilia, which is a sexual interest or, uh, and it's quite unusual. Uh, it's hard for many people to understand. Uh, it is a man's 
sexual arousal by the idea or fantasy that he is a woman or possesses a woman's body or the activity of imitating a woman like cross-dressing. And autogynephilia is one of the two main motivations why natal males, that is, uh, people born uh, male, uh, have transitioned to women. Uh, The other being um, very feminine homosexuality. Uh, So Ray Blanchard is the scientist. He's also a psychologist uh, who came up with this two types theory. Uh, And I knew Ray. I I know Ray. Ray's a friend. Uh, But I I knew Ray for uh, several years before I learned about his theory, uh, and uh, I had already been interested in transsexualism, and I had already been uh, saying things about transsexualism, and I was frankly uh, embarrassed when I learned about uh, the theory that I didn't know about it, because, you know, I was a scholar, of, of uh, an alleged scholar anyway, of uh, sex, sexuality, uh, and autogynephilia uh, is completely different than most people uh, understand transsexualism, which was transsexualism was the word that we were working with until fairly recently when it's become, uh, for some reason, politically incorrect, which means I will keep using it. Uh, transsexualism is the word for people who want to change sex. Uh, so an autogynephilic transsexual is a person born male who typically discovers during adolescence that they're really sexually aroused uh, by the activity of putting on panties or bra, lingerie, and generally uh looking at themselves in a mirror and uh, typically masturbating. Uh, Nobody teaches them this. They discover it on their own. And um, a subset of them become adult cross-dressers. They may even like to go out in public dressed as a woman. and a subset of them will transition. Uh, They will actually get medical treatment to become trans women. Um, These people are all attracted to women. They're not attracted to men. You can think of autogynephilia as inverted heterosexuality. For some reason, in these people, the external attraction to a woman gets inverted inside. They, their primary attraction becomes is, is to the idea of themselves as a woman. And they will, uh, the, the imagery that they like and, and what they might put on themselves is analogous to what a straight man likes in terms of, uh, you know, I, I guess this is dating me, uh, like a playboy uh, or, or a penthouse, you know, a, a very, very sexualized woman wearing, you know, uh, lingerie and, and a garter belt and so on. Yeah. None of these women, uh, the trans women are very fashionable. The, the kind of older in life, uh, autogynophile <laughs> typology, they, they all look a little bit <laughs> kooky from my mm-hmm. female perspective, mm-hmm. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said before there are two types and I, I should say a little about the, the, the other type, uh, which Ray Blanchard called a homosexual male to female transsexual and it's a little confusing because homosexual, what does that mean? You know, it's homosexual with respect to their natal sex. So they were born male. They like men. They like men only. They have no interest at all in women. 
any transsexual, any male to female transsexual who has any interest sexually in a woman is not this type. Uh, and they are feminine from early on, childhood. These are the w- little boys who uh, say they want to be girls. They are dressing as girls uh, as four years old and so on. They are just uh, effortly, effortless, effortlessly and extremely feminine. Uh, and um, they do not exhibit autogynophilia at all. They are not sexually aroused by cross-dressing. They cross-dress because they like uh, girls' things and they like women's things and they feel more comfortable as women. Uh, I knew transsexuals of both types and I think that that enabled me to write this book. I think uh, most people, if they know any transsexuals, they know only one type. And unless uh, somebody uh, is in the uh, gay community, deep in the gay community, they probably know autogynophilic transsexuals who are uh, more common uh, in the West anyway. Mm, That's interesting. That split between... West, because a lot of times in discourse about transgenderism, there comes this, you know, the the fact that this is relatively widespread cultural practice in some, you know, they they always bring up Iran, where, you know, even the the, the kind government subsidizes this. Obviously, the backstory is not explained why the kind government might do this, but, you know, you could get uh, subsidized sex change surgery in Iran because homosexuality is punishable by death. Right. So, yeah, there, there, there are there are cultural, um, you know, it's not not a limited to to a Western phenomenon. Um, but um, is this I mean, how how old is this? Because, you know, it, it does seem like this is has sprung out of almost nothing into the cultural mainstream. And even though maybe in the 90s people were, you know, it was kind of the, the punchline to a joke that there's a woman in a dress or something like that. It was, you know, a, the punch and Judy type situation, kabuki thing. You know, there's a, a little bit of knowledge that this was out there, but it wasn't a thing. It was, you know, very much back alley stuff. Now it's in the middle of culture. I mean, how how deep do the roots of this phenomenon go? Is this as old as the human species or, you know, do you know anything about the, the history of it? Well, it, it's definitely not new, um, and th- there is probably uh, a spectrum of autogynophilia and of, of autogynophilic intensity. Let's say from uh, something that a man might feel mildly aroused by the idea of cross dressing, he might say uh, cross dress, try cross dressing once or twice. To very intense autogynophilia, where somebody actually wants to live their lives imitating a, a, a woman, and I suspect the latter degree is is pretty rare. Uh, but there are um, uh, historical um, examples of that. Uh, I believe there there was a I believe it was a French. Uh, a man uh, from two or three centuries ago uh, who seemed to be like that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, prepared with that person's name or history right now. I could, I, I can find you uh, a, a link to this person's history. Uh, and certainly, um, this was happening earlier in the uh, 20th century, long before the current thing. It used to be something that was a contraindication, thought to be a contraindication for uh, sex reassignment surgery. So uh, autogynophilic males would uh, often lie and say that they were not autogynophilic, but yes, they were attracted to men and so on in order to get approved for surgery. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, is is the fear there that... um homosexual transsexualism is the the real transsexualism and autogynophilia is just kind of a quirk uh and that uh you know people shouldn't shouldn't enable this quirk i mean what what is your feeling about about that about this division 
that that was certainly the justification among uh, gender clinicians, uh, you know, fifty years ago. Uh, so, well, yeah. It, let me make some clarifications about my own feelings about uh, uh, autogynophilic, on uh, autogynophiles and uh, transsexuals in general, and so on. So, um, first, I want to make it clear that I am not um, the foe of autogynophiles. Uh, what I'm a, a foe of, I suppose, uh, as a scholar, is of the denial of autogynophilia, even among uh, transgender persons who don't want to be thought of as autogynophilic. Uh, and I think that my critics back in 2003, four, five, uh, they were mainly autogynophiles who were in denial of their autogynophilia. And I, I think that, you know, that, that they tried to shut me up. Uh, I have been in contact. I've met, I've known, I've been in contact with many autogynophilic, autogynophilic males who were uh, grateful to learn about the theory of autogynophilia because it finally allowed them to understand themselves. And it, it's a very, it's a very weird thing. It's a very, you know, it's a, in many of these people, it's very motivating. Uh, yet it doesn't map on to any common sexuality. They're not uh, unambiguously heterosexual, even though they like women. They're not homosexual, even though they often do fantasize about having sex with men, not because they're attracted to men, but because that fantasy makes them feel like a woman. That's a very common fantasy among autogynophiles. And in fact, some, a, lot of the, a lot of them do have that experience of having sex with men. But uh, I find uh, autogynophiles who are not in denial uh, to be actually often admirable because they're very open-minded. They're doing their best to uh, live uh, a satisfying life given this uh, you know, it's a burden. <laughs> you know, it's something that would one would rather not have uh, because it just complicates life too much. Uh, so um, it is the denial of autogynophilia that seems to lead to the toxic consequence of having to shut other people up, having to forced people to believe or at least act like they believe this alternative uh, explanation that these people are just like women, they're naturally women, and so on. Yeah, it's it's hard to make a, a social justice case out of a kind of a sexual fetish community um, at the moment. So I can understand why, you know, there's much more status tied into being an oppressed minority that, you know, is just being um, not allowed to flower by the general community than, you know, just another another of the, of the fetishes. You know, you don't want to be like the guys with the feet. You want to be like, you know, Martin Luther King if you can. So that absolutely right. And uh, even back when I wrote my book, um, the press... And most other academics couldn't deal with autogynophilia. They, it just it made them uncomfortable, uh, and they preferred, including academics who worked with transsexuals, including academics who worked with transsexuals who were obviously autogynophilic to anybody who knew anything. They, the these clinicians needed for their own sake to believe this false narrative about why these guys were seeking uh, uh, sex reassignment. Yeah. Do you think there is, um, 
I mean, there's a, there's a huge industry that's grown out of um, kind of sex reassignment, you know, the surgeries, the the drugs. Um, do you think there's any kind of more um, maybe dark incentives baked into what's going on right now that that might be pushing this stuff, might be, you know, um, lobbying for this type of uh, legislation for liberalization of all sorts of things that were, were off limits up till now? Because it, it does seem like this is a, a very concerted push from all directions. Everyone's involved and there's only one narrative and, you know, you're, you're a terrible person if you deny it. It's a dark confluence. Uh, but I, I, so I think these people mostly believe what they say. They, you know, they believe, and who are these people? We're talking about gender clinicians who are pro-transition, who won't even consider alternative treatments and explanations. You know, it's all, everybody's transgender who says that they're transgender. I think they, they believe it, but it, it's also, you know, it's nice for them that they get paid to uh, help people uh, transition. Uh, so, and, and both of those uh, facts make it harder to change one's mind. You know, if, if you're getting paid to do something, it's hard to consider uh, that maybe you shouldn't be. Exactly. And you know, a lot of these people just specialize in one one type of mastectomy, one type of reassignment surgery. And, you know, it's a, it's a bit hard to, to, to walk back a specialization. Um, it, it is also interesting to me that, um, like you've noted before, most of the people who are public and visible um, about transgender issues tend to be... Um, autogynephalic males. And you can kind of see that. They're also interesting, or maybe this is just um, kind of selection bias that you see these guys, but they're very kind of people who used to work in very masculine areas, you know, people in the military and business CEOs, like uh, very, very um, male typical behaviors, except for the fact that they wake up at, I don't know, 45 and decide that it's time to, it's time for a very big change. So um, is is this a, a pattern that's uh, visible to you as well? Or is this just the fact that, you know, there are many, many people like this and the most visible people will obviously be the ones that are in high, high places like Rachel Levine or who knows, uh, yeah, big, big names. So I uh, don't think that there's any correlation between autogynephilia and having feminine interests at all. I think autogynephilic males, they're interests as far as occupations and so on tend to be as masculine as other males. Uh, And so it's not surprising to me that we would see uh, military, ex-military or current military people. We probably see more than we would expect. And I do think that is probably a selection bias. You know, leaders going to lead. So the stereotype uh, most associated with autogynephilia is actually uh, computer science uh, for, for some odd reason. Um, but, and, you know, it, we, we want to study this more uh, objectively, but we haven't uh, been able to yet. But that is the stereotype that um, autogynephilic transsexuals are highly disproportionately computer scientist, which is one of the most masculine occupations. Yeah. I mean, this is a well-known and uh, accepted here at the Subversive Podcast. Uh, We're not fighting it. Um, They can have it. Uh, I also, uh, maybe this is a bit, you know, not necessarily very scientific, a bit more esoteric, but it does feel like something correlates with an attraction to to disembodiment. You know, being a computer programmer, you're essentially you know, relegating yourself to being a brain in a vat. You're just, you know, sending out <laughs> impulses, receiving them, st- structuring data sets, you know, moving pieces around in, in kind of virtual space. You're not necessarily very connected to your body. You're, um, you know, you, you, it's easy to see yourself as a meat suit. It's easy to see yourself as customizable, especially because a lot of these guys uh, have interests in in fantasy role play in in games that you know do exactly that. They take you out of your body and into 
this character type life. And I can see how someone who does that for years, decades upon decades can see, okay, this situation that I'm in is not very comfortable. You know, I, I feel dysphoric, you know, even I feel dysphoric about stuff in my life, essentially, you know, sometimes I have a bad time and I could maybe blame it on the meat suit. And then you might want to start customizing and it seems accessible if you're already in that mindset. So the developmental process that uh, I believe happens with autogynephilic transsexualism is as follows. First, I believe autogynephilia happens, and that happens uh, during adolescence, same as other sexual feelings. Uh, and it you typically, most often happens the way I said, where a boy will uh, discover, it turns him on to imitate a woman and wear sexy underclothing and so on. And that uh, hypersexual aspect of autogonophilia lasts, you know, just analogous to hypersexual for male development general, generally, you know, adolescence and, and on. But as that persists, again, a subset of autogonophilic individuals start feeling attachment to their female, they start creating a female identity and, and becoming attached to it. And so it, it is no longer strictly sexual all the time, but it is something that does preoccupy them and not just when they want to have an orgasm. So it's the creation of a, of a different character, of a different role, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I think in, in one of your papers, um, you know, that there is kind of a third type, maybe the kind of the asexual, transsexual, it sounds like, like that, you know, someone who's kind of transcended the primarily sexual domain that this gender came from. And then they just, they just fell in love with the character so much that it's not really about sex. They just kind of like being Cheryl and, uh, they, they like the whole customization of Cheryl. Yeah. The, um, an autogynophilic person who is so autogynophilic that there is no lust available to anybody on the outside. It's all inner directed. They may think of themselves as asexual because they're not attracted to other people, only to this inverted self. Uh, now, autogynophilia is the most, uh, and, and autogynophilic transsexualism, are the most common manifestations of a more general phenomenon, uh, which we're studying, um, and it's related to uh, something we call erotic target identity inversion. The general thing is that uh, it's the inversion of an erotic target inside. And it's not only women that get inverted. They're the most common because most men are attracted to women. but another kind of uh, target that uh, gets inverted. You've probably heard of it. Uh, there are men who want to become amputees. They want to uh, amputate uh, a healthy limb. Well, if you study these guys, turns out, guess who, do you, guess who they're attracted to? Amputees. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, so we have a paper uh, under preparation. We've studied men attracted to amputees. We've studied men attracted to animals. Guess what happens to a subset of them? Become furries. <laughs> and uh, men who are attracted to morbidly obese people. Guess what happens to a mm -hmm. subset of them? They become so, morbidly obese. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these, these uh, people... I think that these three categories were, that we're studying have more in common with autogynophilic males than autogynophilic males have in common with the other kind of transsexual. I don't think that autogynophilia has anything in common with femininity, really. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons that the uh, people who tried to 
ruined me back in 2003 did so. I I, uh, I injured them narcissistically. They're, it's uh, they have um, it's very important to them to think of themselves as really like women. And I'm this theory says that they're not. And I, I believe the theory. Yeah. I, I believe my lying eyes <laughs> yeah. Just when, yeah. when noticing some, some of these, uh, some of these people, I mean, I, you can see that there is effort in, in this uh, surgery and everything, but just, it is it, just sad in the sense that, you know, just from, from the skull shape to just the proportions of the face to everything, you know, like the, the wonderful cover you have for your book. I mean, this is essentially the, the general feeling that that cover evokes is every time a normal person who's not completely indoctrinated, you know, beholds an autogynephalic male um, who, you know, is trying, everyone's trying to, to protect their feelings, but, you know, it is what it is, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, gay men um, are also not women, <laughs> even very feminine gay men. Uh, but very feminine gay men, I think, are naturally feminine. I don't think anybody taught RuPaul, at least uh, until RuPaul started studying drag. Uh, but RuPaul was a very feminine uh, boy before he was a... Right? I don't know if RuPaul is now a she or he. But before RuPaul was RuPaul, RuPaul was a very feminine boy. And I think born that way. Uh, and in that sense, I do think it, it, someday we might find that there are parts of the brain uh, that make RuPaul, uh, RuPaul better, kind of like a woman's brain. But I think that when we are able to know more about autogynephilia and its representation in the brain, we will not see anything similar between um, women and autogynephiles. Another uh, common belief asserted by some autogynephiles, and especially those in denial, uh, is that, well, women are autogynephilic too, uh, meaning that uh, women are also turned on by the idea of being women and wearing sexy clothes and so on. And this came from a study by a guy named Charles Moser in which he uh, asked basically that, you know, or imagine you're like getting dressed for a date and uh, you're, you're wearing sexy clothes. Does that, is that sexually arousing to you? Well, a few of these, his respondents, I think he had like 30 respondents said yes. But uh, recently, during the past year, we did a big study of this question uh, comparing autogynephilic males to natal females and to natal males without autogynephilia. And the differences between autogynephiles and natal females were huge. Natal females do not sit around and say, oh, I'm so turned on by the idea of being a woman. You know, it's just, it's not a thing. No, that, that there is something that I think is is similar. I mean, you know, obviously not speaking from science, but just kind of observations throughout my life and just being a woman. It's this idea of kind of being regarded from from the outside, you know, the idea of, of a man seeing you as attractive. And that that is, you know, exciting for a woman. You know, that's why the whole makeup, the whole thing and the whole process of it is, is interesting. Uh, but the, the end result is you kind of, you don't arouse yourself. The idea that someone else finds you irresistible, that's what's arousing in, the, in that whole context. Right, right. Yes. And, you know, the the... The questions on the autogynephilia scale, the, the true one that Blanchard wrote, include, have you ever been sexually aroused by the idea that you are a woman, <laughs> <You know? laughs> by by the fact that you have a female body? Is that, you know? Yeah, that's where you can kind of yeah. see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, uh, I, I appreciate them trying. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Um, what what do you think about um, you know because the, the, it's it's been documented. There's definitely um, quite a lot of uh, what's what's this called? Um, kind of 
kind of viral spreading of certain types of transgenderism on the female side. I think uh, Abigail Shire wrote wrote a book about this, um, and uh, that that it kind of propagates almost um, almost like a meme. You know, people hang out in these circles. You know, all the all the girls in the class are suddenly transgender. Um, but what do you think about this as a more general thesis? Because yes, let's say teenage girls are easily influenced, but the idea that having all of these paraphilias, you know, out there in pornography, on the internet, easily accessible by everyone of every age, at every stage of development, you know, I know a lot of parents are not exactly clued up or clued in about all the pornography that their children are watching. So uh, people are exposed to a lot more of this imagery and these concepts and these possibilities than ever before. And do you think that this might m- push the spectrum into, you know, people actually wanting to live out this stuff more than back in a, in a time where these fantasies were just not available? You know, this this type of, no, people weren't incepted with these ideas from, from, from the outside. So rapid onset gender dysphoria, which uh, you've had guests talk about, is a, certainly a thing, and that is, um, I believe that many, perhaps most, perhaps almost all of the adolescent girls whose gender dysphoria began during adolescence uh, would not have transitioned even 15 years ago, wouldn't even have gender dysphoria 15 years ago. I think it's entirely a social construction, entirely a a new phenomenon. But I think you're asking about uh, like autogynophilia. Um, I understand that uh, autogynophilia is associated with uh, a kind of pornography called sissy porn, which even though I study uh, autogynophilia and I'm not, you know, I've watched porn only for work, but uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever come across sissy porn. I think you'd actually have to seek it out. And if somebody seeks it out, I'm suspicious that it is an exogenous cause. That is, it's, you know, I wouldn't be this way if I hadn't seen it. I think, you know, it's more likely that somebody was looking for it. Um, I, I, I do think that it is plausible that social, there is a cultural influence on the decision to transition among even more traditional kinds of transsexuals, though, autogynophilic and homosexual transsexuals. And it, it would be like this, uh, being trans is cool now. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, something to be ashamed of. Uh, and if you have the desire, you're more likely to find somebody encouraging you to transition than to find you discouraging you, at least outside your immediate family. Yeah. And it's, it's, a am I'm not saying an easy way, but it is one way of, you know, someone who might be like a, a, a white male, but not in a, in a, an extremely good social position, you know, kind of a low status type person who, um, you know, maybe feels, like I said, a bit disembodied with things to get a different type of status, to get into a community that, you know, might find him or her more, more interesting and more, more compelling. So, yeah, I mean, I can, I can understand that there are lots of incentives like that. You know, if something's high status, uh, the people will come, they'll, they'll gather around it somehow. Yeah. I think that the autogynophilic explanation to some autogynophilic males automatically takes the status away from autogynophilia. So if, if that's the reason why I'm doing it, then I don't want to do it. But not all. There are some autogynophilic males who whose um, desire to transition remains even after they've accepted autogynophilia as an explanation for their desires. For those people, I'm not sure it's a bad decision. You know, I, if you know why you want it, if you know the costs and the benefits, then 
I'm not going to uh, raise much of an objection. Uh, it's I'm more concerned about people who don't understand why they want to do it. I'm more concerned about autogynephilic males who've not even heard of the concept of autogynephilia or who uh, angrily reject it. Yeah, and uh, I know there's a large community of detransitioners in kind of the, the the female space where you kind of have these girls who started on puberty blockers, maybe they had mastectomies, things like that early on, and, you know, in their teenage years. Uh, and then they realize, oh, this is a grave mistake and they're trying to wind back the clock. And um, But is there such a thing in kind of autogynephilic males? I, I could imagine that, you know, having having the surgery is a very serious step to take and if you're doing it for the wrong reasons or you don't have a you know a good picture of 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 you know your mind a good theory of mind of what what exactly is going on with you you might have second thoughts after the fact but i i haven't really heard about many of these cases i mean the the uh, data from uh, about so-called regrets people who wish they hadn't had sex reassignment surgery most data that we have are relatively old, uh, you know, let's say 30, 40 years. And they're mostly from uh, clinics that were very careful and didn't let people transition unless they had, you know, uh, had a couple of years living as the other sex uh, to make sure that that's what they wanted. Uh, and those data did suggest a, a higher rate of regrets among autogynophiles versus homosexual transsexuals, but it wasn't high. It was, let's say, maybe 10% for autogynophiles regretted versus, you know, 3% for the other kind. But we're in a whole different world now. Uh, you know, nobody is making people live for two years as the other sex before they get medical intervention. And it wouldn't surprise me to have more regrets. In fact, I, will ex I expect that we will have more regrets among the adolescent females who transition, at least. Uh, as far as the, as far as autogynophiles, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we'll find. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on, only time will tell. I think this uh, on on mass uh, surgery campaign has, I think, only got going in the last few years. So, uh, yeah, it's, it takes a while for people to 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 wake up from from the party. Um, there's a, there's another subject that you've you've written on, and that might be even more controversial, especially for my audience. It's um, pedophilia, which you know, on the right, is a bit uh, is a bit of a ex extra spicy thing, and I understand why. I mean, I'm uh, viscerally also very affected by it. I have, I have children. Uh, it's, you know, <laughs> not something I want to think about. Um, and I, I understand why people, um, have this visceral reaction because yeah, there's no deeper instinct than that of protecting a child, especially for someone who has one. So, um, but you are maybe take a little bit of a kinder tone here because you have studied, you, you know, people who have these instincts, you study the phenomenon, you're a bit more closer to the field uh, in which these things happen to me, these are these are monsters and projections on the walls, and I don't. I hope I don't know any pedophiles, so I, you know, I, I don't. I cannot. Um, I have no shred of empathy for for this phenomenon. So that's kind of where where I'm starting from. So you know, I'll let you just just say why why maybe I should soften my case or why why there should be any sort of uh, attention, positive or you know, interest paid to this field. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The first thing that I want to say is that we must distinguish two things. Pedophilia, which is a sexual interest in children, from child molestation, which is sexually abusing children. Uh, not all pedophiles molest children. And I am aware of a large group of pedophiles who have organized to mutually support each other so that they will live 
child celibate lives. They will never touch children. Uh, and I find that, uh, I find it admirable because, uh, you know, they do have their, their desire, their sexual attraction to children is just as strong as heterosexual men's attraction to women, homosexual men's attraction to men. Uh, and they are also, you know, they, they have lived in shame and, and so on. And uh, it's not that uh, I think that they should be proud to be pedophiles. I just think that they should uh, not be shamed for having feelings that they're not going to act on and that they're going to live good lives despite of. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all, all, all sounds good on the face of it. I think the, 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 the primary pushback to that would be that, you know, this, these things are at least, you know, stigmatized for a reason in the sense that it, it feels like, you know, am I, am I going to trust that this is the case, you know, cause this is a bit of a honor system type thing where they just, you know, they, they're organizing, they say they're not going to do it. I'm like, how can, you know, how can I be sure, you know, how, how much of an integration into society can you allow, um, you know, um, you know, maybe there is a case to be made that, okay, if this is your sin, you might need to be exiled from, from the rest of us in one way or another. There might be, you know, chemical castration, you know, call me crazy. There, that might be an option. There are different methods, different levers that we can pull, but there has to be a clear line between you and my children that has to be enforced 24 seven. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a nice person, but I'm not that nice. Yeah. I, I don't think that they're lobbying to babysit your children or, or to live uh, as a community of pedophiles who are known to be pedophiles. I think that they're mainly wanting to just support each other and be left alone. And, and believe me, there are people trying to harm them as a community, uh, which I see as very unfortunate. Again, I think that there's stigma against harming children, and we should keep that. I'm not sure stigma against attraction to children uh, per se is going to make any difference, because I, I, I think whether uh, uh, a male is going to be sexually attracted to children or not is determined by the time he's born. Uh, and you know, I, I, I want to bring a dilemma up to you and I want to do it as sensitively as I can. Um, so give me a moment. I, I know you've recently had a child, uh, so, but I don't want to talk about your child. Let's talk about a mother. Uh, who has a son who she raised and he's been a good son and she loves him and um, it turns out at adolescence uh, he discovers he's attracted to children. Every pedophile in the world had a mother. Uh, and I'm pretty sure every pedophile in the world had a mother who didn't want him to be a pedophile. Uh, what would she want for this son? Would she want him to be demonized and set off from society? She surely wouldn't want him to act on his feelings. Or, or would she want him to be helped in the best way possible? There's no help that will make him not attracted to children. It just, you know, people have tried. We don't know how to do it. it, it, it someday it might involve uh, some kind of brain surgery, but we, we don't know how to do it. Uh, your example about um, sex drive reduction, castration, chemical castration. 
uh, that can help somebody who has who's at risk. In fact, my uh, first uh, introduction to this topic was that I was an expert witness for uh, a, a pedophile who had actually uh, uh, molested two girls by using a toy gun to get them into his car to touch his penis. Uh, and then he, uh, he himself chose to be surgically castrated, which I thought was a good idea for him. But, and I, I was for a while uh, thinking that that would be a general uh, intervention for pedophiles. But uh, the more I've learned by studying these guys, uh, the more I've recognized that many of them don't need that. They're fine. They're not going to molest children. They're, they're not tempted enough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if if there is a reliable measure of of not tempted enough, you know, and that's you know been proven <laughs> time and again, I might take that instead of. But yeah, you know, I'm I, I personally am not averse to to using whatever social tools or even you know biological tools to 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 solve this problem. But it is it is a problem, and it is you know that there is also a little bit of um, a little bit of hysteria now related to pedophilia and I can already hear somebody is shrieking. No, it's, there's not enough hysteria. There is a little bit in the sense that it feels to me like it's, it's the last acceptable boundary. We have a culture of consent and because all boundaries are off you, you have these last little ruins of a, of kind of a, a virtuous society. And the age of consent is an, an important red line that even people on the left, people on the right seem to always converge on to kind of hold on in, in the consent culture that, you know, it's, it's the last vestige of something solid. And it always comes back to, you know, age gap um, discussions, you know, how big should the age gap be? All sorts of little negotiations around this red line seem to be the, the what's going on in discourse now. So you, yeah, yeah but, but before you go on, you, you're young. Uh, so you don't remember, maybe you've, um, heard or read about it, but back in the 1990s, we had, um, a general epidemic that I think was actually uh, larger and more harmful than the ROGD epidemic. It was the epidemic of recovered memories of sexual abuse and uh, an associated smaller epidemic of multiple personality disorder. These were um, typically women in therapy who uh, came to believe during therapy that their fathers typically had uh, molested them over years uh, when they, they had never remembered this, they'd never thought this until they went into therapy. And, and, yeah, uh, I personally know someone, someone like that you know, okay. up to this day, she maintains it, but just yeah. re exactly recovered memory type thing. Yeah. The, anyway. <laughs> the, the, these, these memories are false, uh, and have ruined, uh, many a family. And I think that they are, uh, a result of hysteria about related to pedophilia and child molestation. Uh, there have been other, uh, there have been people sent to prison who are innocent. There have been people put on trial. There have been, you know, we, we, we must remember as, as a society and I, you know, I'm counting you, 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 whatever America does, you, it's going to get to you eventually. Uh, many a people have been harmed by this hysteria about uh, childhood sexual abuse. And I, I think more people have been harmed than protected by it, actually. But of course, that's a, I guess, a, uh, a discussion to be had. And this probably takes us too far off track. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a sad thing because I you know you you can feel in in the discourse and in, in in when when you're talking to people that there are certain areas that are off limits and a lot large part of the discussion around pedophilia is off limits um, and like I said in a way I understand it because um, you know to to bring it back into the esoteric 
I feel like a lot of these things, you know, if, if they're invoked too much, if they're talked about too much, they kind of, they have a way of being sucked into the discourse and self-replicating in a way, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk in kind of the more esoteric corners of the right wing about demonic possession, about demons and things like that. And some of these things feel like they have some, some of that quality that, you know, you're invoking these dark and terrible things. And, you know, like I said, as a mother, sometimes I just, <laughs> no, not necessarily, I don't want to delve into this, but as a sex researcher and people in your field, I think should, and that is your role. And, you know, it should be very much, open to, uh, to uh, study because it's important. I mean, it's important even in the implications of protecting my children and, you know, the mother in your example's children. So yeah, it's, it's necessary. So like I said, I don't think everyone should be on this beat every day if possible. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, and I, unlike some of the other issues we've been discussing, there is really no group who's advocating that pedophiles should be able to act on their desires, except for a small group of pedophiles themselves. Sure, you can find them uh, who say there's nothing wrong with it and so on. But I don't think that's even a slippery slope. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, I've, uh, like myself and probably most of the people listening to this have not had enough uh, contact with uh, with the advocacy and exactly we know what, what's being talked about because of this you know this this feeling of of cosmic horror that, that you get when you even contemplate the fact that you know there are people out there thinking this man they must they must be completely completely monstrous and I guess you know the the reality is that there there are people with with monstrous uh, tendencies but like you said they don't necessarily act on them so yes well I, on on this cheery note, because I tend to <laughs> tend to wrap things up on, on very happy subjects, uh, but I think this is not necessarily a a dark subject. I think you know the the conclusion here is that um, it's an area of study. It is not studied enough, and you know um, maybe more awareness should be raised. <laughs> Though that's not always a cure, but yeah, maybe people should understand it. I'm I'm happy with yeah. that. So, yeah. So, um, I want to ask you the question of the show. Um, do do you have a uh, subversive thinker or, or multiple that uh, that you'd like to recommend to our audience? I do. Yes. Uh, been looking forward to this. Uh, first, just a brief uh, introduction. When I was in college, uh, my roommate was a philosophy major, Arnie, uh, and Arnie was. Uh, um, very influential on my thinking. Uh, I often wanted to kill him. Uh, and it's because he was very good at challenging me, challenge, challenging my uh, weak suppositions. And, and that's, that makes people mad. And I think that that's a lot of what's going on in the culture wars now is people are getting mad because people are, are challenging them to think. Uh, and I think that philosophers, um, when they are doing the best kind of philosophy, where they actually are bothering to learn about a topic and think hard about it, they can be very useful. And so I'm going to recommend, and I, this is cheating, but four different philosophers, and I'll do it quickly. Uh, first is a guy named Michael Humer, who has a substack called Fake News in OUS. Uh, a, a most a recent uh, uh, essay he wrote uh, that I thought was really good is called "Elon Musk is Better Than You." Provocative title. Uh, another one: Can treat, teaching the truth be racist? Also good. Uh, the Croatian philosopher Nevin Sesardic, uh, uh he is an older philosopher. I think he might be emeritus now, but he wrote a fantastic book called Making Sense of Heritability about the IQ, genetics, uh, literature. And uh, I thought he did a great job dealing with a lot of obfuscation that uh, both philosophers and academic experts engage in to have people 
avoid this topic. So I recommend his book. Uh, there's a young philosopher, I think he's really smart, named Nathan Kofnes, uh, who uh, is currently at Cambridge, and we're hoping that he manages to have a career despite many attempts to cancel him. Uh, and he's uh, written about how we should study the most controversial topics, and that's totally uh, what I support. And finally, there's a guy named Alex Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, at MIT. Alex's uh, work has mostly been of the technical philosophy genre, and I don't read much technical philosophy, really, but I heard rumors that he's writing a book on gender and transgender. And I've heard rumors that it's excellent and very readable and uh, really going to be like the best uh, treatment of this domain. So that's it. Excellent. Yeah, I I hadn't heard of three of these. Uh, Nathan Kaufness, I want to have on the show hopefully soon. I'm uh, I'm aware of his work. Yeah, he's 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 great. Um, yeah, I'm um, I'm I'm glad that you had so many good recommendations and so much insight onto into things that um, we we either tend to avoid or maybe we look at uh, too intensely recently, <laughs> like the transsexual debate, uh, and it's it's easy to miss some of the some of the important nuances and also the fact that we're talking about people in the end. I mean, the people who are suffering with things that they. Um, might prefer not to suffer with. And this includes, you know, everyone that we, we, we discussed. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that. And thank you for your work. Uh, and thank you for putting up with all the bullshit because yeah, it's, it's been, you know, almost decades now that you've, you know, had to deal with, with all this. So well, and thank you for doing this. I've found, uh, several subversive people, uh, through you and I really enjoy your podcast. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on, Michael.